Welcome to this evening's virtual convocation with Stephen Pitters. My name is Chris Brown, and I manage the archives here at Centenary College of Louisiana, and I also serve on the Convocations Committee. It's my pleasure to facilitate this event, which is underwritten by Centenary's Attaway Professorships in Civic Culture. In the fall of 1967, Stephen Pitters, then from New York City, enrolled at Centenary College. He is among Centenary's first Black undergraduate students following the college's racial integration in January 1966. These days, he's a poet and host of the Spokane Open Poetry Radio Program in his home state of Washington. For tonight's presentation, Pitters plans to focus on his centenary experiences and have students reflect on past and present issues related to diversity on campus. I'd like to also mention that Pitters will be back again with us hosting an online poetry reading on January 19th, 2021 during Centenary's Dream Week. I gotta say just for a moment that I'm looking forward to this event tonight because my job involves connecting people to information. It also involves learning from the past to prepare for the future. And it also includes the idea of institutional memory. Think about this for a second. Centenary was established in 1825. 141 years later, the first black students enrolled as undergraduates in 1966. One year later, Stephen Pitters arrived at Centenary, and he has an important story to tell in the life of our institution. Just a little bit of housekeeping about this structure of the convocation. During the presentation, you'll be hearing from Mr. Pitters I will also be sharing some related images. Also, get ready to interact. This presentation includes some opportunities for audience participation. You can use the chat box in Zoom or the question tab. We also highly encourage spoken responses from attendees, but I will need to manually unmute your mic. So just use the raise hand function or type in the chat if you'd like to speak, and I'll unmute you. You may also wish to identify yourself as a student, faculty, alumnus, etc. Please note that this event is being recorded and will be posted on the college's YouTube channel in a few weeks. And finally, centenary students seeking passport points, I will provide a QR code on a slide toward the end of this event. That does it for me. It's now time for me to slide out of the way and give the stage to Mr. Stephen Pitters. Thank you very much, Chris. And I, and I wish to thank all of the centenary organizers, obviously Chris Brown, Kate Pedrodi, and Heather Wetzel for putting this opportunity um, together for me. So that having been said, I would like to start by reading a poem to you that pulls together four years of my centenary experience all in less than three minutes. The particular piece is called Enter and Exit. I approached a strange building at noon on a Saturday while the sun was bright and gray, its yellow rays shining downward ate at my skin intensely. Footprints made showed the body taken where the mind wanted to explore. The encounter with this Southern history's harsh geography whose tracks I long deplored. I proceeded through the doors nevertheless and extended a courteous, reasonable salutation. Hello to the untarnished moment where the pink azaleas outside recently blushed. To my face, those therein were cordial. That would later change when the instant passed and attitudes rearranged in defense of their upbringings. Hope circled around me. It was a good friend to have thereabout. I would need it for comfort since the bait innocently entered the lion's den. Asper aspersions froth forward after two weeks time. 
the scribble on the unsanitary stall was an uncouth message unworthy of a retort in kind. The challenge was hurl, stay or leave. The chase was afoot. A plan was called to rescue. Slow, stay low, build a wall, but remain tall, evidence of your style, grace, and confidence. Repel any borders quietly, distinctively, without fanfare. Demonstrate less tension, glide like an eagle above the fray. Be cool, as they say in New York. You are not on parade, though easily seen. Social intrusions came, this came his way, off and on like a light switch. He had need to master the darkness, yet remain inert between offense and defense. Knowing the difference that comes from winning a sprint or a marathon, his gouging and gauging speed, time, and distance equally. Each turn held an opportunity for enlightenment and the attainment of the success awaiting my incandescent quest. The year which began, the journey moved on. Its alarm became a fluttering yawn, an ember that lost its glow to other years that came and went as quickly, days, nights, months, their time tested cousins with seeming ease. The good we have can always be shared when we encourage ourselves to perform what is right, fending off the wrong that creeps along, stalling our, for our forward progress. Looking back, the years that led me upright onto the stage, clasping the diploma with my right hand, a stronger young man. That is enter and exit. My, I, I started this poem and finished it today, this morning actually, to clean up some parts of it. But to put in, into a poetic context what it's like to be at Centenary for four years. So let's get on with, this, with the convocation. I say thank you very much for having me here. And um, pleased and honored to have this opportunity. So here are some questions because people ask, well, how did you come to Centenary and why did you choose to come to Centenary? And so I need to step back in time. And the first question I will ask to, um, those of you who are sitting and tuning in, what does it take for someone to leave their country and go to a foreign country? That's your first question and you can think about it or if you choose to jump in and answer it, feel free to do so. The reason I'm, I start off with that question is because I'm an immigrant and I came from Panama to New York City and I'll get into that shortly. My next question to you is, why would, why would you go from the North to the South knowing how Blacks were treated, the lynchings, the disrespect, the bombings of children and adults the arson, the, shoot, the shootings. Why would you put yourself in that, in that situation? Or to quote you know, Dylan, the times, they were a changing. And when you step back, because I have a clinical background, I think about, and this is what I'm throwing out there for you, is we prepare ourselves or are prepared directly and indirectly not really knowing where we will end up, but this is the underpinnings that serve to help us move towards something that seems the thing to do at the, at the particular time. So what we're really saying in, from a clinical perspective, consciously and unconsciously, the way our social upbringings are is formed over time and it impact and it's impacted by one's core family values a clear sense of self being strong and independent coping strategies that you de develop belief systems all of these transform one's emotional foundations and qualities so that when we make a decision like the one i made 
It's not because it's something that just happened out of the blue, it's because unconsciously I was prepared to do this. So I'm gonna take a pause and see if anyone has any questions, uh, responses to the questions I put forward. Okay, um, I, I saw something come up on the screen, but went away. So it's from Jeff, Jefferson Hendricks. All right. Yes, I do see a couple of questions coming through. And again, if anyone wants to speak, we have that option. Just mention in the chat, hey, I'd like to ask a question and I will unmute your mic. Um, but so far, we have a message from Jefferson Hendricks. What was most surprising about moving from the North to the South in the 1960s? That's for, that's the question I, I posed to him. So, uh, or is he posing it back to me? <laughs> uh, he, he is posing it back to you. Okay. All right. The, the biggest difference well, has to do with, well, let me back up and give you some background history which can answer it more readily, okay? Uh, the timeline that I'm using is 1958 to 1963. Arriving in this, country, in this country, New York City from Panama City, Panama, not Panama City, Florida, wherever. I attended uh, Ascension Catholic Grammar School um, and at the age of 10, fourth grader. School location was on 108th Street between Amsterdam and Broadway, um, Upper West Side of Manhattan, five blocks from Columbia University. And the thing about it is our class composition were blacks, whites, Asian, Hispanic, uh, Irish, and Italian. And the social mixing that we um, were, you know, came, came to be was on all levels. Sports, I mean, we played basketball, football. We did not play flag football. That was a first. I never played flag football until I came to, to um, Shreveport. Uh, and so forth. So we played all the sports, not to mention they tried to socialize us by, you know, with the CYO or the Catholic Youth Organization dances so that at least we'll <laughs> be, you know, realize that it's okay to dance with young ladies. Um, and after school, the, you know, we would gather what, you know, in New York, you call it the stoop, which is usually the steps of a six story apartment building. And there's about 15 of us because again, we all live within um, two or three blocks from the school. And so after school, you ran home, do your homework, and then you came back up and you gathered at this one place and then you start roaming because the Catholic diocese, you know, the Catholic parishes are like 10 square blocks. And our, our parish was from 100th Street to 110th Street. Uh, although we roam a little bit up to 116th Street, where Columbia University, part of Columbia University, and we would, you know, move around, especially like on the weekends, we would roam from uh, Riverside Drive, which is the hut where the Hudson River is, and then go all the way over to Morningside Heights from 100th Street up to 116th Street. So here we are moving around um, in this uh, social context with. No, and this is boys and girls. So again, the thing is, what does that do? You're used to diversity, okay? And that uh, scenario happening helps you to become more adjusted. So the same reality is when you talk about moving from one country to another, it is because obviously you're looking for something better than you've had, um, you, your beliefs are, I, I know when we came from, from Panama, all the things that you've seen about United States or New York, you know, you, you literally be, believe that the streets were paved with gold. I mean, so that, that's really the, the answer to the question. 
but also what's interesting is never saw snow before. So the first time I saw snow, we ran outside and we jumped in the snow and jumped and jumped and had a great time. So I think that may answer some of the questions. Next question. So I see more people posing questions to you rather than answering the question. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I can, I can answer the questions. I was still trying to do that. So um, I saw a question, but I couldn't read it quickly enough. Sure. If, if it was I, to I can read some of these to you. Um, yeah. Let's see, again from uh, Dr. Jefferson Hendricks. Stephen, what is your best advice to a young person of color or any young person about navigating their life in college and after college? Okay, uh, I'm glad you answered that. Um, to navigate one's life before or after. <laughs> I have a whole lot of, of uh, notes here about that, um, but these were, Okay, I'm just gonna answer the question. To navigate one's life is, is a matter of having your dreams um, and being prepared, you know, hoping that your family were supportive. Um, you know, but it's more or less having a dream. You, you know, what are your goals and aspirations? That's, that's the main thing. What, what, your, what are your goals and aspirations? And if you have a goal, for example, and I'm not talking about uh, coming to Centenary as such, but a wanting to go to college. I mean, I, when I was growing up, um, what was really you know interesting is watching the, the early TV programs like Ozzy and Harriet or Dobie Gillis and all of those things. And all those kids seemed like they were having so much fun. And you know, the idea of going to college was whoa. You know, and you had your side saddle, opera shoes on, and it was like a dream. You know, I want to be. I want to. I want to go there. I want to have that lifestyle. So, if you have a, a dream, and not to mention if you are really focused, and the core of the family, you know, like family values, is my, in my family, my father set the bar high, and academics was paramount. So, and that is what we've passed down to our children. The bar is high. And you will, it's not, not if you go to school or if you go to college, you will go to college and you will go to graduate school and postgraduate school. It's all set. That is what we, you know, that is what in our family is our focus. Okay, so does that answer the question? Stephen, I'll also jump in and say there are a couple of questions being posed to you that I think will be addressed once you walk through the your timeline here at Centenary. So okay. we might I'll move off on some of these. Move questions. on and get to that point then. Okay. Okay. Um, let me uh, throw a question back to someone when anyone in the audience. Based on what my intro was, how many of you from the South have had the same type of uh, upbringing that I had in terms of a multicultural in um, upbringing? Anybody? From Chris Brown to anyone. Okay. All right. So I'll jump in and say that one of our attendees, uh, Dr. Jay McGrove, has written, uh, Stephen, I'm going to take a stab at answering one of your questions to us. Okay. I've heard, I've heard from other black scholars who chose to attend private white institutions with harsh reputations because they understood their attendance there as activism and accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, it's interesting that uh, I, I love the answer uh, because the information I have here addresses that in some way, shape or form. For example, um, I, you know, because I want to give a little bit of uh, historical uh, aspect of this, a little bit of background due to the times. We're talking about the early, you know, the, mid, the early middle 60s, but we're also talking about what's happening now, which is to say 
how many of your grandparents or parents were involved in the civil rights movement? So put that one out there for you to think about. And how many of you here today have faced discrimination, segregation, life-threatening ev uh, events, and if so, what type? So I'll pause to see if I, there's any response to, the, to those two questions. All right, and I'll move on then. And if so, what have you done to address it or change it? Again, consider what was going on in, this, in the times of civil rights. Consider what has gone on here in this country this summer, okay? All those particular things, um, the murders and so forth, you know, and what have you done to address that? So those two things are this, they're similar activities based in similar situations. So for example, you know, I'm just going to throw off a, a, a short list of uh, situations in terms of segregation and historical factors, uh, the, lack, the, 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 the lack of voting, the civil rights movements, uh, the Congress of Racial, Racial Equality, which, that was formed by students, sit-ins, boycotts, protest marches. A lot of those things were came about uh, because uh, college students want to become involved, like the Green the Greensboro students in North Carolina. Um, and then you talk about they want to address segregation. The Freedom Riders, which started on May the fourth, nineteen sixty one, both black and whites. They face violence and hostility. Mobs burn their buses in, in Alabama. All of those things, um, people saw the need for change. Uh, you know, Attorney General uh, then Robert Kennedy sent the U.S. Marshals to outlaw segregation in public school transportation. Now it comes down, and I'm going to you know use these points to answer a question about why does did one or why did I choose to come to Centenary per se. Now, if, if you remember, and you may or you may not, you, know, you may have to talk to either your teachers or maybe you have already read this information or your, again, your grandparents or parents might remember um, that Ruby Bridges, 1960, first African-American child to, to desegregate an all white elementary school in Tylertown, Mississippi. 1962, James Meredith, first black student admitted to Ole Miss, which was previously a segregated university. He was later shot by a sniper in 1966 while on a march to encourage voting, but he recovered. 1963, President Kennedy gets shot. 1963, Medgar Evers, then a field marshal for the NAACP voter registration efforts, was assassinated by white supremacists by the white supremacist Byron De La Beckwith in Jackson, Mississippi. Now I'm going to jump a little bit on the side because I mentioned Jackson, Mississippi. In 1972, I was a graduate student uh, in Boston, and a friend of mine's mother had just passed away in Jackson, Mississippi. And she got in touch with me and I came down to you know, pay my respects. What happened is I was walking up the main drag up to the, the, to the state capitol and I saw a, a flyer in, a, in, a, um, in the telephone booth. Because remember, those were the days when you had telephone booths, not and everybody has a cell phone. And on the flyer, it read, or stated, be a man, join the clan. And I said, whoa. So I went in and I took down the flyer, folded it and took, tucked it in, my, in uh, my inside pocket. So when I went back to Boston, I can show my friends in Boston, this is what, happened, this is what they're still uh, talking about back down there. Okay, so <laughs> that's just yeah, one of those things. And again, when we're talking about things that might inspire you to, to act, uh, you think about the 1964 Fannie Lou Hamer, a uh, voting rights organ organizer, 1965, the Voting Rights Act, 
1966, Malcolm X uh, is assassinated at the, uh, uh, the Audubon Ballroom. Stokely Carmichael in 1966 um, the, uh, founded the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and he was the first to use the, the, the phrase black power, and that happened in Greenwood, Mississippi. So now we're moving into my first uh, semester here at Centenary College and the why I came. Well, the times were, were changing everywhere. When I was, grow I was growing up in New York City, and just like we saw this entire um, summer, folks were marching and all of these particulars and the, the, you know, the, the, the speeches and all of those things and the Freedom Riders that I mentioned before and Ruby Bridges and uh, James Meredith and Martin Luther King's speeches and the Selma March, uh, not to mention um, Governor Wallace saying, saying that he's going to segregation forever and all that sort of thing. So um, all of the things were happening around me and it's like, I've got to do something. I just cannot not do it you know and it's like what college do i go to and things of that nature so what what happened back then um they had a thing called the grab bag and um, you'd send all just like you you know apply to colleges in these days you send your information in and um then they you know whatever school you know thought you met their criteria would you know send you back information saying they would like for you to come to the school or not. So that is what happened. You know, I got, um, actually I got information from Kansas and then a fellow got in touch with me um, and, you know, I met with him and he did a slideshow about the azaleas and the warm weather. And I said, warm weather, good, azaleas, beautiful and Mardi Gras. So when people say, <laughs> you know, why'd you go? You, go, you come to an uh, institution of higher learning for many different re reasons. Sure, the institution has good academic qualifications, but most in the, um, institutions do. But it's the little things that might, you know, grab your attention. Um, not to mention, uh, well, for, I can tell you on the side, uh, my youngest daughter, just started at Colgate this year and we drove you know the year before we did our college you know run around the countryside and all looking at all the IVs and the thing that you know Colgate's incredible school and everything and when we finished one of the one of the things they did because they have their own creamery they gave us ice cream sandwiches <laughs> So talking about leaving a, a good taste in your mouth, <laughs> that's it. That's the school. But you know, I wasn't going there, but it, it captured my attention. So freshman year in um, it, at at Centenary was my hardest. Um, trying to find my way, and it was truly very difficult. I mean, I arrived, I arrived by myself, my two bags, luggage, were well, one bag of luggage and my, um, my uh, phonograph. And, um, you know, as I said, I walked in, I signed, you know, saw Mr. Williams, he assigned me my room. I went upstairs and uh, my roommate was not in the room at the time, or maybe he was, I don't quite remember what, what that situation was. But that was, you know, after I checked in, I walked around um, and tried to feel comfortable. And then I went, walked out of, of Rotary and, you know, went out just to kind of walk around the campus. And then I um, saw a bunch of guys playing flag football, flag football. And I remember, you know, and one of the guys actually was two of the guys were from New York, New York City. And um, so, you know, you know, we hooked up and we were playing. And the, the thing I remember about that game was um, there was a fellow named Mark and he was good. I mean, I tried to grab his, his um, flag and he did a spin move and left me with only air between my fingers. It was really good. I mean, he was, he was really good. Mark, Mark, Mac, 
McMurray, I think his name was. But, you know, that was, you know, the first part of it. But after the, we played, we went across the street. And see, I was ready not to be served. I mean, I was so ready because that's what I'd seen on TV and everything. So th there was about four of us and we walked over to the Greasy Spoon. And, you know, I think that restaurant is still across the street from the college. They have some really great hamburgers, but even better, incredible pies. I mean, that the, those uh, fruit pies, the banana pie, and the, oh, it was too good. I mean, <laughs> Uh, Strong's. Thank you very much, Craig Shelton. <laughs> Strong's. I mean, not, that, that was a great place. So anyway, walk over there. We sat down, and I'm ready here, arms folded. You know, you know, I know they're not going to say, you know, going to serve me. I mean, it's going through my mind. And sure enough, they served me. And I, you know, and then I said, well, you know, I'll have to wait until the other guys get served. About five, five or so minutes go by, and then you said. Excuse me, but you served me, but you didn't come around to serve my friends. And the, the, the guy says, well, the law says we've got to serve you, but we don't have to serve them. <laughs> that just blew me away. I mean, I was caught off guard. I didn't expect them to turn the whole thing around. <laughs> so that was one of my first events. My very first day is, you know, the surprise sort of thing. I met my roommate later. His name was a fellow named Bert from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. And, you know, we got along fine, you know, um, but, you know, nothing, ex you know, overwhelming. Um, we just, you know, stayed on a different side of the room and we talked. Um, but that was just the way that went. But nevertheless, the other reality was at that time, the school population was 1,500. So, here I am, the only black li living on campus, and there's 1,500 people who doesn't look like me. And <laughs> so I was like, okay, what, you, what are you going to do? Uh, one of the other realities, now you start to get involved in the day-to-day -day life of the school, okay? Um, walking on the, you know, on the walkways the first day that following Monday after everybody had signed in, or maybe it was a, you know, a couple of weekdays thereafter. Um, the things you get to, you know, you pick up on is when people walk by you and they look down or they look away and you don't, you know, it's like, do they realize that what they're doing and it's obvious what they're doing, you know? So those are the little things that starts to, you know, percolate. And they, you know, um, again, the question is, has anyone of the multicultural students experienced any of those things or have experienced any of those things? Maybe just a freshman at, you know, at this time, uh, because it changes over time, but have uh, you experienced anything of that nature? Um, because it does play, it, it, it's, it's, you know, again, if you are not used to um, that type of behavior or if you grew up in a multicultural environment and a diverse environment, then you know how to deal with these type of things. Okay, um, from Mary to all the panelists, there were several. I couldn't get that question to answer it. Can someone say it back to me loudly? Sure. This is Chris. Uh, Mary says there was. Excuse me. There were several young black men from the East Coast attending Centenary, as I recall, mm -hmm. at that time period. Well, in that first year, they weren't. But over the, the, the next couple of years, um, for example, in the second, in my second year, um, I think we had um, uh, a, a, a basketball player. In my third year, they had more. Um, and then there were other, about well, two or three other guys who were not um, athletes who came to the school. And I have this information as I go along because I'm going along uh, by year by year. And, um, but yes, they started to a few, it was just a few though. There wasn't, you know, again, you're talking, there's 1,500 students there. And, um, the dynamics and the social interaction were minimal. 
that much, I, I know. Um, but as I said, uh, set my second year, it changed, and I'm gonna move into that at this time, but just to answer the question, yes, they were, but not in 1967 or 68. Um, uh, maybe in the, in the, in the uh, in the fall of 68, um, the, the folks who, who, who came at the time um, were there. And I said, it, um, I think if it was Jesse and Claudel Lofton, Jesse Marshall and Claudel Lofton, and um, I think maybe Ken, and, um, and there were a, two guys named Ken. Um, may have come in. in you know, I might be getting ahead of your story, but you you mentioned your freshman year a moment ago. But you yeah. haven't talked about your experiences on the freshman basketball team yet. Oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have all of that, and <laughs> but I, I said I got offline because I want to answer the question, you know, to set it straight. Um, when I was on the basketball team, that was <laughs> it was like a movie. It was like truly a movie. Why? Because when we went on um, the away games, I remember it was at an away game. The coach, the, you know, as you can see, there was only nine of us uh, on the team. And when I was in the game, I was bringing the ball up. I was a guard. I was bringing the ball up. And the epithets that came from the crowd was not what I needed. Uh, I said it was like something out of a movie. And I, I remember running, you know, walk in, in my mind, I was saying, coach, just take me out, take me out so I can be away from all these people. I mean, it really impacted my game because, you know, you're hearing it and there's so, so much venom and it's like, come on, I'm just here. I just want to play some ball. And, you know, it's like, you know, get off the court, you know, what you're doing and all this sort of thing that was going on. And that happened, you know, consistently, you know, when you know, at away games. So that was that part of it. Um, but again, the, the issues, you know, that I'm trying to, um, you know, bring you to see is a big picture. It's like, how do you cope with it? How do you cope with the day, the day to day? You know, it's not semi indifference. Um, it was like social distancing. <laughs> it was. <laughs> um, but also Try to understand this part of it. Caf cafeteria. When you go, to, when you went to the cafeteria, and folks would not sit next to you, or even worse, they'd get up and leave if you try to sit down at the same table. And that's happening: breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So you know how you deal with that. Well, <laughs> you try to get there early, eat fast, get up and leave before folks came. Okay, so those were the things that um, one has to understand when they go on day in and day out, and you've got to deal with that. You you know, it starts to bubble up, and you just want to stay as much away as possible because it it, it is not a pleasant environment. Let's put it. You know, just imagine if any one of you out there in this audience at this time experience anything of that nature and it does not have to be a black thing or a white thing because it can happen to white kids at white schools just like it's happening to black kids at a white school and even maybe black kids at a black school because you are either not in a in a, in a fraternity or a sorority but in this situation it was blatant okay but again things got better each year it got better. It was not as dynamic. And then um, if you made friends, it, you know, it made it a little bit easier to go to the cafeteria and not have to worry about that, the fact that somebody may just, you know, get up and leave or, you know, not want to uh, have you sit with them and so forth and so on. All right. So let's move on a little bit more. Um, this is the, this is again, another I call these movie type things. <laughs> and the, the movie script was um, you go to the bathroom and you get the N-word written on the, on, the, on the bathroom stalls. 
And um, so you're like, oh yeah, yeah, I've seen this in the movies, but I guess it really is real, it's happening here. So you tell yourself, hey, it's their issues, not, that it's not mine. And the other thing that happened is the weekends were hard because a the, there's a great number of kids who went home for the weekends, you know, because they came from the four states. And so the campus got really quiet. And the campus in and of itself was like a water hole in a desert. You were reasonably safe while you were on campus, but off campus, now nah, that's a whole different thing. And I'll get, I'll get to that in a, in a little bit. But just to tell you what it was like on those weekends when it was quiet and it was gloomy and so forth. So again, as anyone experienced any of these type of events that I mentioned, like the cafeteria type events. Um, so it's probably not, again, how do you prepare for that? Okay, because it was not one of the things that I expected as much to happen, but when it happened, it, you know, it's uncomfortable to, to deal with. Why, why am I talking about this? Because when, I, when you look at the big picture, it's coping skills. No matter where you go in this life, in this world, in this country, and, and so forth, if you do not have strong coping skills, it makes it easier for you to go internal, become depressed. And when you look around, the person is here in this semester and they're gone the next semester, because that is what happened. And again, it, it plays back to how you were raised, what was your environment, and so and so forth. So understand that a strong internal fiber needs to be in place for you to deal with these things or at least turn them around and as we say anybody here with children it's called redirecting instinct instinctual energies you have to redirect them so that you don't become overwhelmed and and so forth or somebody needs to prepare you for it okay um so depression regression these to academic withdrawal. So consider those things in terms of, you know, as any, as any behaviors of that nature um, cross your path or are you feeling in, in, in that negative type of way? So. Um, Stephen, I see a couple of comments coming through and uh, there are questions posed to you about kind of your support system or, or what existed for you on campus. Like, for instance, you, you shared the basketball team experience. How did your teammates respond to that? Or uh, a different question, just with all this alienation you're talking about, mm -hmm. were you able to find any sort of camaraderie or social protection during your okay. freshman year? Um, I think the people who were the most consistent were some of the professors. Um, I know um, Dr. Pate, Dr. Carlton, um, Dr. Pledger, uh, you know, they were, they were just flat out really, you know, good people. Uh, I remember going over to Dr. Pledger's house and speaking with him. And, uh, you know, he, he was just an incredible person. And later on down the road, when I started taking courses, in uh in the drama department um miss alexander i mean she was just too fantastic for words uh she helped me out a whole lot um so primarily that and also the difference being later on when um i think maybe it was my third year and you know i know i'm jumping ahead and jumping back but, but you ask me the question and i can answer them now I don't have to wait to answer them later on, you know, answer what you, what you said. Um, my roommate, uh, I guess in my third year, uh, Mike, we got along famously. I mean, super famously. I mean, uh, we, we also got into, faced a lot of issues, you know, once when we left the campus and I'll get into that later on. But, you know, he, he was, a, he was a, a, a great friend. And I, um, but in that first year, I was pretty isolated in that first year. Uh, and so that's the nature of it. Um, the other thing 
that I want to throw in here is, you know, and I just is something I just thought about, you know, preparing my notes for this presentation is, you know, I wonder how the school itself prepared for, uh, for me. And the reason I mention that is because now, um, you know, in this day and age, you know, the, the colleges have so much electronic wizardry and information that, you know, you know so much about what, you know, to expect when you go there. And I say that because our youngest daughter, you know, her preparation for in the face of this pandemic and all that other madness that's going on, getting prepared to go to Colgate, uh, they, they, <laughs> they put forward so much information that you practically felt you knew the place inside and out when you got there. And so, you know, just to, you know, and that's only, you know, even though I really, you know, had a different experience, but I wondered because uh, remember my, when I met the president, a very nice gentleman and Dean of Studies, or Dean of Students, very nice, you know, I mean, the, the administration were fantastic here at, at Centenary, I mean, like it is. The only thing they asked me was trying not to get in trouble. <laughs> and I tried not to get in trouble. But they were fantastic uh, individuals. And uh, I, I really felt comfortable, um, you know, knowing that these people were concerned with my health, welfare, and safety. Um, and, you know, going back to, uh, the, you know, the, the question you asked about, what it was like, um, and I, I think about the preparation that my daughter went through with us and the school, the virtual classes, you know, it, which is, even though there's difficulty in terms of the pandemic and so forth, and the virtual learning challenges, I think those things have, will serve us very, you know, very well down the road uh, as, as they have. and. So to kind of move on a little bit through, one of the things I just wanted to throw in there is you know, breaking through and developing friendships. And that started to happen, that's, that uh, occurred. And um, you know, people started talking to me and I started talking to them. Um, and on the backside of that, however, some of the people who you know, were cordial and friendly, uh, received backlash from their own friends just by being civil towards me. And, you know, I, I knew this, you know, only because someone who was, you know, just a nice person uh, experienced that. And, the per and she never said anything to me. She never changed the way she said hello or goodbye or whatever uh, until like the spring of the year. And, you know, I said, you know, all, all these particular things happen. Uh, and, it's not a one-way street um, in terms of how you cope with certain, in, you know, issues in certain environments. So, um, one of the the other things to I'm just going to move on a little bit. Um, I think of the spring of '68, or as someone had mentioned before, uh, that there were black students who came and said. Yes, that happened, but it was, you know, um, when I was there, it was not in my first year. It was more in my second year. Um, and also knowing how to survive in order requires fortitude. Okay. And um, it, it is, um, it is it's the two different events that happened to me, which were the most dynamic in January of 68. I was um, doing some uh, student teaching over at a middle school, not too far from the school. And one day when I was, was on my way home, it started to rain. And what went through my mind was, oh man, I, I don't want to be out here and getting wet out of my best suit. So I ran into uh, a gas station to make a phone call to someone at the campus. And then the fellow in the gasoline station said, boy, 
get off that phone. And I looked at him like, what? I'm from New York. This was going through my own mind. I'm from New York. And then he said, well, to use the N word and get off and get off that phone. And he pulled the gun. And I said, okay. <laughs> the funny thing that happened to me, I wasn't afraid, but a sudden sense of being tired drifted over me. And I just like, I just felt empty. And so I turned. I wish I, you know, I, I could do a Michael Jackson, you know, moonwalk, but that probably would have ticked the person off. So <laughs> I just turned and walked out and I got so wet. And all I'm thinking about, here's my one good suit and it's all wet. But this black gentleman came up in, the, in his car because I'm walking by the highway and he just kind of knew that I was not from here. <laughs> so he turned, he gave me a lift and made my, you know, made my way back to this back to the school. So as I said, I learned that they're good people, you know, of all colors, and they will help you as need be. And when um, another thing we're talking about uh, in 68, and I, I think about you know, um, John Carlos and Tommy Smith in the 1968 Olympics and raising the Black Power uh, uh, hand, and also uh, you know going home when Martin Luther King got killed. And that was scary. That was real scary uh, because some of the guys who were from New York were going home. So you know. Jump, you know, I jumped in a car with them and we went through Knoxville. We didn't, we were smart enough not to go through Memphis. But we, I don't know why we went through uh, Knoxville, maybe just to get something to eat. But it was so quiet, so quiet. And the state troopers were so tall and big and had guns. And it was like, oh Lord, what is going to go on? We're going to get shot here. <laughs> but we didn't. And we made our way to the highway after you know going through uh, Knoxville and Sandy just floored the car I mean I think we went from like zero to 80 or so and we just went we just kept going for like 30 minutes before we start we slow down so that was another that was one of those scenarios um, so again when you look at those particular changes and I'm going to try to bring you back to the present in terms of think about this summer what happened this summer Okay, anybody, I don't know, is anyone, is anyone of you from Kentucky? Think about Kentucky, Breonna Taylor, shot by the police in March of this year. George Floyd, killed by the uh, police, uh, May 2020. Uh, Jacob Blake, shot by um, the police in 2020 in Wisconsin. So again, all of these things were happening now, were happening then. So, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Okay, that is the question. What are you going to do? Um, so, did everybody, I hope folks in the audience uh, cast their vote and so forth. So, if we, we look um, forward, looking down to the fall semester of 68, uh, social expansion. Connections in camp on campus starting to be part of social clubs like MSM and Newman Club playing flag football. All of these things help to reduce the, the social isolation. Um, not to mention uh, in, in 69, in my junior year, things were even better. The social conflicts were not on the campus, but they were still when you left the campus and so that was you know you always had to be uh, aware of that i remember there was a um a uh an event on ca on campus there was uh they, they brought in a, a band and that was fine and after the, the band played and so forth walked down to um the little pub close to the campus and a cop followed me and waited outside and i was like oh this is not what i need so those things off campus were always there. The campus life got better, but the off campus um, scenarios remained the same. Uh, and, you know, remember, you know, with, with my, my roommate, Mike, uh, we, we ran into two events, one being um, 
when we went to get gas at a nearby gas station because we were house sitting at his aunt's house and the guy you know, was having issues giving us the gas and Mike got upset and said, <laughs> said something to the guy and the guy asked his, 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 his uncle for the gun so that you know, we had to run. <laughs> And then another event that happened to us was we were at the levee having big fun and a bunch of high school kids came up and we, we ran out of there, jumped in his Volkswagen and they chased us all the way back to school. I was glad that when we got to the school, Officer Smith was there to let us in and those, those kids kept going their own way. Uh, also, good things, uh, we, we went to the trip to uh, at mid-semester uh, mid or between semesters to uh, Mexico uh, with, with Professor Curbelo. And that was a great time. I mean, what, 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 but what the interesting thing was, the group of us who went, we got along famously and everybody was good. But that was not the same level of socialization when we were on campus. So again, different environment, different behaviors were being demonstrated. Um, I'm going to jump in and just share the QR code for the students who need that since we're close sure. on the hour mark. But we, okay. we can certainly go further. Um, <laughs> but just so that they have access to that, if any of them okay. need to leave, let's share that for a moment. Um, and Stephen, I know you had, we had talked earlier today about your increasing involvement with organizations on campus. And mm -hmm. we have some photographs to share of that. Mm -hmm. um, so, just so line let them go. All right, I'll leave that up for just a few more seconds for anyone who needs that. So while you're doing that, I'll okay. While you're doing that, I'll just throw in. Uh, a little bit more about the, the Mexico trip with, with uh, Dr. Curbelo. Uh, we stayed in Saltillo with some families. Uh, we ran around. Um, it won't let meds. I think that, I'm not sure. I will try to figure that out right quick. You can okay, go Okay, so I'll just kind of move on through. In terms of that Mexico trip, it was so much fun staying with the, with the Spanish families, going to the um, the floating garden of Xochimilco, and climbing the pyramid of the sun and the moon. Those were all great time. You a student trying the the QR code? Um, yes, sir. That's just a message I'm trying to. Same. Okay. <laughs> and another, I, I, I'm just going to jump ahead because as you said, we are beyond the point or whatever. Um, I think between my junior and senior years, those were things were just more open all around. We had more uh, black male students and some black female students. Um, but the other part of that is, um, Again, you know the 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 social club. I have to have to give a shout out to um, uh, F F Father Paul and the Episcopalians. <laughs> Used to always make sure I went down there and get a meal. I think it was on Thursdays because he set an incredible plate. <laughs> Wait, you have to think of ways to cope and expand your your area. I mean, and being part of MSM and the Newman Club, everything was expanding. And again, with the other black students coming in, I was no longer, as I mentioned, I was no longer the exotic one. And personally, I was feeling just so much more comfortable. Uh, I was uh, I was also an RA, which is hey. He wanted to be an RA, and I was an RA on the third floor of Rotary, and we the majority of the floor were single rooms, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, and so, so things just changed in many ways. Not to mention, uh, should I forget this? It was terrible. Um, the, the the drama department. I started, you know, go, taking classes down there, and those those 
those students were very, I mean, they were super nice. And um, yeah, there's that one with Iron the Ruin. Um, and so those people were so nice, those students, they were, you know, welcoming and, you know, it was just a whole different scenario being down there and because I took a number of courses there. Um, and I remember Mara Saad was a, you know, that was a play. Preparing for that, going to the, um, the, the, the what you call it, the uh, hospital where for, for people with mental, mental illness and so forth, and getting really into the mindset. And we, we practiced in the same outfit for the entire two or four weeks uh, that it was to get ready. And I tell you, we smell bad. But, I mean, when, when the play started, Mr. Busick used to do this, you know, start the play before the audience came in. And so we were all over the place and, you know, you know just spitting and dribbling and everything like that. I mean, we smell bad. <laughs> so the people <laughs> the audience were like, what's going on? But it was a great, it was a very great play. It was really a great play. It was a lot of fun. And um, I also uh, participated in Uncle Remus, uh, a reader's theater. Uh, and that was a lot of fun as well. But though, you know, all these particular things were coming together. Not to mention, I got to go to uh, Alaska with um, Dean Armont. And um, it wasn't only myself, uh, I think, um, uh, what was his name? Uh, Fadi Tranjan from Syria. You know, he went along. So we had a, a, he had more multicultural kids coming to the school by then. So again, the main thing is that things were better. You know, this, yeah, that's the, um, the, the trip to Sitka. Um, and that, that was really a lot of fun uh, all the way around. And one thing that you haven't mentioned yet that someone asked about, uh, Dr. Grove said, did Centenary contribute to your career as a poet? Or do you feel that would have been your path regardless of your college experience? Well, probably it would have been because I started writing poetry in, um, in, in, high, in high school. And yes, um, I mean, I just took all of these um, English English classes, and I I, I remember Mr. Fackler. Um, I, I mean, taught me very well, and I, I really got into it. And it, it, I, I'm glad that you have the slide up the insights because I was the you know, um, um, I, I helped put together this particular. I was like the editor of the of the literary magazine in that particular year, and as you can see, you know <laughs> that's one of my poems. <laughs> Bl blatant, blatant um, self-serving. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it, the English department in the centenary was outstanding, without a doubt, and uh, writing just became so much a part of me, and has continued to this day, uh, and. Um, it, it, it was it was it was a lot of fun. I took uh, English course uh, classes with Dean Thad March Marsh, excuse me, and he had my dad and I over to his house. You know, the the weekend of my graduation, and um, I, 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 incredible person. I, I I really learned a lot from him as well. I mean, I I learned for I think from every uh, professor whose class I took, I learned a great deal uh, about many things. But when you talk about, you know, English, not, oh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Professor Cox, Dr. Cox and, and philosophy. I mean, he was too in, incredible person. I, I mean, I love, I think I took about four classes in um, philosophy. And at one time I wanted to, go, you know, to, to major in philosophy, and he, but he, he set me straight. He said, it may be interesting, but you can't feed your family <laughs> having a, a philosophy de uh, degree. <laughs> but I mean, and I remember two, uh, two of my friends, um, again, again this, this time it's the junior, senior year, and um, two, of our, two of my friends who were in the class as well, uh, they were married and they would have us over to their house and we stay up, you know, late at night talking about philosophy 
uh, what is what is and is what is what it is, but it isn't and all this sort of wild stuff. And it, it was just a lot of fun. I mean, life there on campus in my junior, senior year was really good. Um, it overcame the, the challenge of my first year uh, there. But again, things, things rolled. And the good thing, I think, when it came to graduating, I, you know, I remember when I got on stage to get my degree, uh, Dean, Mar uh, Dean Marsh says, I'm glad to see you here. And with that, I guess I can come to the end with this poem. We met as unknown strangers may, when one would ask the time of day. We met, we spoke and shared a smile and lingered on a little while. We met and then the signals changed as though this all were prearranged. I wonder when and if we'll ever meet again. So thank you very much for having me and I hope that I answered some of your questions. And uh, just remember, uh, str strength of will, courage, strong family values, um, uh, ways to cope with anything because you're gonna you're gonna run into the stuff no matter where you go and how old you are, uh, how old, young you are in life. But you know, it, it's those things that will prepare you to overcome the vicissi the vicissitudes of life. <laughs> So thank you all for tuning in and some some of my old friends and I love to make sure we're better at keeping up with one another because uh, this is 53 years later and we're still on the planet instead of in it. So thank you very much. Well, I see a lot of, of thanks coming along through the chat box. As we wrap up, and, and certainly if people have any last minute questions, you're welcome to pose them in a moment. I will go ahead and give the outro for people who need to leave. But I just want to thank Stephen Pitters very much for taking the time tonight to, to join here on Zoom and uh, reconnect with his alma mater, Centenary College. I'd also like to thank Centenary's Convocations Committee members who helped out with this event and Centenary's Attaway Professorships in Civic Culture, which provided funding for the event. I'd also like to thank all of you for attending. As a reminder, our next convocation, which uh, takes place Tuesday, January 19th, 2021, at 7 p.m. Central Time, is your new friend, Stephen Pitters, doing a poetry <laughs> reading as part of Centenary College's 2021 Dream Week, which is an annual celebration of the legacy and achievements of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Well, I see some more things rolling through. There were, let's see, a question is, Conversations on Altered Pathways, your most recent book. Is no. Recent? No, Conversations on Altered Roadways is the first of a five-part series. And right now, my most recent book, believe it or not, uh, I sent a copy of it to, to um, Mr. Brown, um, and it's called Virus. But I, here's a, a quick background on that. Uh, in March, I, I just published uh, con, uh, contesting because I normally you know publish a new book every uh, every year. And right now, I have 16 manuscripts, eight of which have been published. But anyway, I published that. But then, with the with the pandemic, I wasn't able to do much. Um, any launches because I mean it was not healthy for me or for anybody else. And I was not going to have uh, social, you know, social gatherings of any type with that. So I just, you know, all the books are on Amazon and Kindle anyway. However, I got so caught up in writing about about the the I, about the, the the pandemic, and every time I watched the news, I got so angry and frustrated, and so I had to write. 
So which is, you know, I write poetry every day, maybe one or two, but at least one every day. And so I saw something on the news. It's like when those kids were in the pens down there in, in, in Texas, I wrote something about that. Um, you know, whatever that was coming out, I was writing above about it. And so I end up literally to this, at this particular moment, I have written um, easily about 70 poems about the virus. And the new book has about 50 of those um, in there, not all, well, let's say they have about 43, and then the other other poems I put in there. So it's not all about the virus, and which kind of be, can become a like a system, what we call a systems overload. So um, the new book is called Virus. It's on Amazon and Kindle, and a copy of it is at in the library, so you can check it out. And what I do is whenever I write, I collaborate with. Um, local artists, musicians, as a visual artist, and, uh, and I would give the individual a poem and ask them to translate it um, into their own medium. So uh, for this one, and also I, I, I collaborate with musicians. For this one, I, I collaborated with a friend of mine and she made a song um, of, of, from it. And one of the things that I do is I have a page on SoundCloud, which you can go to and you can download the eight poems for free. I always start off when I do a poetry reading with telling people, these are all freebies. So, and there's eight songs um, from different poems, from different books that is yours for free and so forth. So that's the long answer to conversations in altered roadways. I just found that SoundCloud link mm -hmm. and dropped it into the chat box for anyone interested. Good, thank you. And my, I should say that my, my daughter has done the cover. She did the cover for, for Virus and she's done the cover for six of my eight books that's been published. Um, but uh, anyway, but that's just another aside. I said I have collaborated with with the book contesting. I collaborated with a, a it it um, there's a poem in there about Justice Ginsburg, and I collaborated with a a, a quilter who did a, a this big quilt about, you know, with the face of the face of Justice Ginsburg. And then I collaborated with a pottery person who made this big, um, almost, it looks like a, a triangle, uh, pottery triangle that has the lines from the, from the book. I collaborated with two visual artists, a musician who wrote, uh, made a song of the poem that's in that particular book. And in, um, I have other, books that I collaborated with a sculpture that was in that was the sixth book is with a sculpture sculpture but again collaboration is essential so you want to think about it from a uh, educational point of view it's good to collaborate with folks and if you're an artist of any type collaborate you know with other artists and it's just a lot of fun um, because you'll find out that they too want to collaborate with you, you know, depending on what your um, artistic um, direction is. Stephen, I see a couple of images that I made slides for that we never use. There's a handful of us still sticking around. I will go ahead and flash them on the screen. If you have any thoughts that you want to share, you're welcome to, but it's some of those uh, like the intramural council. Oh yeah, <laughs> Delta, that type of thing. Those were just fun times, you know, to be part of those organization. Yeah, uh huh. Yeah, there's uh, yeah, I, I remember all those guys. A couple of those guys at Teeks, and um, and Butch Kuszewski said I played against him in football I think when we you know in in I didn't know him then we just played against each other in Catholic school uh, football uh, league and then found that it came down here 
but yeah, that that you know, and then this is the, one of the Lambda Iota Tall. Uh, again, that's that's that shows you the change, you know, meeting these different people and you know being asked to be part of those types of organization. That was a lot of that was a lot of fun, you know. I mean, life at Centenary was a whole lot easier um, on the campus uh, because things have changed. You know, this, you know, I said there was you know, many other blacks and uh, foreign students as well. Uh, so with the, the experience was more like what I dreamed about um, going off to school. And I'm glad that it, it became that and that I was able to make friends and there's her peers next to me uh, to my, well, to, to my right, you know. And um, so there, you know, I, I made some good friends uh, down the road while, you know, as things moved on, people became, you know, it was just easier to talk uh, to folks. And yeah, I guess maybe for them, it was a surprise as well. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah, the one. I looked so serious there with my fro and mustache. <laughs> well, I still have my hair. Well, those are all the images that I've grouped together to share tonight. Okay. Um, I don't see any more uh, questions that are awaiting us. So I think we can go ahead and wrap up it, at that, unless you have anything else. No, I can. I will have to say thank you very much. It was my, it's been my pleasure um, reminiscing, so to speak, <laughs> um, and realizing that you know change. They are they are they're here. They are here, and I hope that as students um, that you you know find it in your way to be involved in those changes because they're there. And it's your time. That sounds like a good way to wrap this up. So again, Mr. Pitters, thank you very much for spending this evening with us. And to those of you still hanging around with us, thank you so much for joining. <laughs>